Today, Shivali's back on to talk about her personal Amazon selling journey the last couple of years, what she learned working on a Walmart listing case study, details on a cool tool that's exclusively for very large brands and agencies, and even how she represented Helium 10 as Miss USA at an international beauty pageant. How cool is that? Pretty cool, I think. Are you an agency, enterprise level seller, or an eight or nine figure seller and need advanced analytics? Market Tracker 360 might be the product for you. To get a demo of Market Tracker 360, go to h10.me forward slash mt360. That's h10.me forward slash mt360. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Serious Sellers Podcast by Helium 10. I am your host, Bradley Sutton, and this is the show that's a completely BS-free, unscripted, and unrehearsed organic conversation about serious strategies for serious sellers of any level in the e-commerce world. And we've got somebody who's been helping sellers around the world here for the, now just two years, just past her two-year anniversary here at Helium 10. Shivali, how's it going? It's going good. How are you? I'm doing just delightful. Thank you. Now, let's just, first of all, before we hop into to what we're going to talk about, which we got a wide variety of topics that, ranging from Walmart to to advanced analytics for, for large brands uh, and more, let's just catch up with, with you a little bit. Two years, you've been here. Like, What's some highlights from your, from your time here at, at Helium 10 now that you've been here a little bit? It's definitely hard to quantify my highlights, mostly because there's been so many peak moments. I've had the opportunity to connect with amazing individuals in the industry, learn a lot about Helium 10 tools, um, and then also just about scaling your business. So it's been really neat to go from being somebody who was just getting into selling on Amazon all the way into uh, connecting with really powerful people that have achieved incredible heights of their business or even exited. Yeah, absolutely. Now you, you know, like it's you yourself actually decided for a while at least to kind of like stop selling the product that you did have. So, you know, that's, I think that's important that, you know, some sellers are just like, Hey, I'm just going to keep going, even though it's not working out this product, you know, but got too competitive, but I'm just going to go ahead and lose money. But what were, what were some of your decision or what were some of your thoughts? Like what led you to say, you know what, I'm going to stop selling this product or just sell out and then going to, you know, regroup at a later time. So when I was first getting into the product I was selling, into the category I was selling, there was a really good profit margin. I think it was at about 40 to 45% profits. And that was with a gap kind of built in in case I needed to spend more on ads. And uh, maybe there was some time for inventory storage because I wasn't quite approved for Amazon selling on Amazon just yet at the time. But unfortunately for me, there was about nine or 10 months. And I think I talked about this the last time I was on the podcast, but there was about nine or 10 months where I just had my inventory sitting in a storage. Mm -hmm. And so by the time that I got into that, that field, it was a drastically different landscape. And so I had to make some business decisions of, okay, well, like, yes, I still have some profits left, but it's not really as great as I want them to be. And then uh, the competitors, there were so many more competitors. And of course, that changes the entire outlook of your business. So going into looking in the number, looking at the numbers, and then by the time that I was really starting to sell out of that inventory, I decided that I didn't want to stick in such a competitive field where I would be losing money day in and day out. As much as I love the product, as much as I know it was a high quality product. And of course, if I had continued throwing money at it, yes, maybe yeah. uh, in the long run, it would have become profitable. I have definitely talked to people in the industry that were like, oh, my pro my product just became profitable. And it's been maybe two years that they've been well, okay, in that now That's space. a little extreme to wait, right? <laughs> to lose money I for have. two years before. Uh, I have. I, I literally just heard this. Somebody was selling on Amazon and their product just became profitable after two years, which is a really long time. And for me, it's just not what I wanted to do. So um, I made the executive decision of stopping selling that product, not placing any more inventory for it. But I am in the process of relaunching and I'm quite excited about that. Cool. And you, you haven't stopped selling books on, on Kindle this whole time. You're no. still doing that, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So I do have a couple books of my own, but I also publish ghostwritten books. So books that I have hired writers to write because I've, it's very much similar to a physical product. You find a niche that you could do well in, you get a book written, you make it better. And then you of course get it posted, uploaded, 
and then advertise or drive traffic to it. So I didn't even know you did similar. that. So, so, so like yeah. you have an idea of, of something that you think would be, be good, but since Bradley works you to death, then you don't have enough time to write it yourself, I guess. So then you actually like, what, what do you do? You find a writer and then you tell them your ideas and then just, and then they write it for you. It's very much like being an employer and finding somebody to do that job for you. So I usually post something on Upwork. Uh, you can use Fiverr, but Fiverr I typically use for maybe book covers. Upwork is where you make a job posting and you'll have writers apply for it. You tell them what you're looking for. Maybe you want a long-term relationship, which I definitely have had writers I use time and time again. But also you can do maybe one-off projects and then just input in, you tell them what you want. Maybe you provide an outline. You give them some milestones, say, hey, like I want to check in with you after you've written X amount of numbers or X amount of pages. And then you'll take a look, you'll proofread it, or you can give them kind of input of what you want to change and then work towards the second and the third milestone, depending on however many milestones you want to have. But yeah, that's how you build out a book without necessarily taking all of your time. If you find someone who's in a different country, of course, you can do it for a lot less uh, and you're still paying them the right amount for their work because they're in a different country. So I do believe in the ethics of that business and making sure that these people are paid for the work that they're doing. But it's definitely a lot more affordable for us in the United States, maybe just to get that product out. It's yeah. about the ROI, right? How fast you're able to write that book and get it published. And and impossible to lose money, or at least you know, I mean, in the production because you're not investing in any inventory. So the, so that's a uh, yeah. That's it, a it would if it's ghost written, yes, it will be maybe like two hundred, three hundred dollars, mm -hmm. depending on how long your book is really. But then after that, you can absolutely drive free traffic to it using Facebook groups. You can use websites that already exist. I've paid before like twenty five dollars just to have my book included in an email listing or not an email listing, but you know, an email forward that goes out all the time to readers that are constantly looking for new books. And it pays off even more, especially if it's a, a very niche audience. So maybe if I have a book that's in stress management, maybe somebody who uh, caters directly to self-help, to a self-help audience, it's going to pay off a lot better. Okay. Now I remember you actually, you know, talking about your relaunch uh, of products you had actually shared some of your ideas uh, with me. Now, now, what what were some of the ways that you were doing your product research? Like, how how did you approach it? You're like, hey, I know I want to 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 get you know restarted with some private label products on Amazon as well instead of just books. So, so how did you approach your uh, product research? One of the highlights. At Helium 10 has been learning just how much, how many different ways you can do product research. We have a lot of various tools here at Helium 10. We have, of course, X ray, you have Black Box, you have your Pinterest Trends Finder, you have the reverse ASIN searches you can do on Etsy. Well, I kind of employed all of them. So I went in, and it's a really exciting part of your business, right? Trying to figure out what you really want to build your foundation in. So I actually did go into Black Box, kind of played around with the filters, made a short list of items. I also went into Etsy, tried to find things that were unique that I think could have some demand on uh, Amazon. I also went into Cerebro, tried to see related things based off of what was really appearing inside a black box, or maybe even if I'd taken a word that I'd found on Etsy and put it inside Magnet, there was just a multitude of different things that I'd employed. And as I went into the validation process, kind of took a look at what the competitors look like, how many reviews there were, are there actually ways to amplify or enhance the consumer experience? That's when I started to really narrow things down. And then of course, you have the profitability aspect where I was looking to see how much it would cost me to source, and with all the customizations, would it actually end up being green in the long run? Not to mention, I did also uh, attend a show as well. So that was my first time ever going to a trade show. And it was a really, really, really exciting experience for me. I remember I put you and Carrie in a group and I was texting you guys like photos of the, of the event because I was so excited. But I got to meet a lot of the manufacturers. I actually got to meet one of the suppliers that I had placed a sample order with. But, which but was th really this was here cool. in the United States. You, you didn't got, yes. go to China. You didn't have to go to China for this. So. No, no. Sorry for the lack of context there. But yes, this was in the United States. It was in Chicago. I ended up getting a message from a supplier I had placed a sample order with. And he was saying that their company was going to be at this inspired home show in Chicago. Oh, so that's, that's how you found out about it was from yeah. that supplier that you got. The, oh, okay. 
Yeah. So he mentioned he was going to be there. And so I looked into it and I, I've been wanting to go to a Canton fair in China, but I don't believe that's on the horizon for me at this moment. So the Inspired Home Show was a little bit of a quicker trip for me where I could still experience what it might be like to be in the midst of a bunch of manufacturers and just really have that one-on-one contact. So it was an amazing experience to really sit down with my suppliers and co- and just make that connection in person. I also got to find some additional factories that would be willing to work with me to build a brand new product. And that also comes with a lot of uh, really exciting opportunity. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, you know, people might think, hey, to meet Chinese suppliers, you have to go to China, but sometimes they come here uh, at different at different shows and expos. So it's something to, uh, something to look into. Um, all right. Now, one last thing. You actually got to represent the United States oh, in a yeah. world-class beauty pageant. So, like, first of all, there's, like, Miss Universe. There's miss world and then there's like what are the uh miss super national which is the one you did and there's like one other like miss grand international Miss grand international so there's five yeah (laughs) so what you did is kind of like like miss universe but it's it's like a separate what group or something like that separate organization yeah it's the same way i always explain it with a parallelism to banking systems you have wells fargo you have bbit you have all these different banking systems they have sort of a similar intention but sometimes they're just different organizations so for miss world miss universe miss supranational miss grand international they all do somewhat of a similar thing which is bring together really ambitious women and men and they can compete and be offered an assortment of different opportunities that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. I mean, that's a massive stage with a lot of eyes on it. So it's really cool to take community work that maybe you're doing, a cause that you're really inspired about, or even just be maybe given modeling contracts uh, if that's what you choose to do, and just have that platform to really elevate you to the next place that you want to go to. So yeah, I did Miss Supranational, and their whole motto is to inspire and to aspire. Uh, and it was really neat. It wasn't something, it was something that I had been working on. I really did want to represent the United States at a international level, but I just, I didn't know when it was going to happen. And it, it was actually cool. I saw one of your videos there. You had a shout out to helium 10. Now you didn't end up winning, unfortunately the, the, the competition, but anyways, you know, you, you did helium 10, helium 10 proud. Now bringing it back to what we're, what we're here to talk about today, um, I wanted to first talk about this project that you did with with uh, Carrie. Um, we had, you know, we, we, there's this hemp case study product that I've talked about, you know, on this podcast and other times I, I've shown, I've used it as an example uh, about listing optimization and things, but they had never sold on Walmart. And you yourself, uh, you know, your old product, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe you ever sold that on Walmart. So w- this was like your first kind of entry into selling on Walmart, th- this little mini case study you and Carrie did, right? Yes, it was. I was actually interested when I was taking a look at all the numbers on Amazon on selling it on Walmart at the time, but they had a very different threshold for selling on Walmart at the time. They were looking for, you know, study revenue and you had to be selling for a certain amount of years. They were looking for experienced sellers. And I think I was still getting started. So it wasn't really the something that was offered to me. Um, now that's changed a little bit. They are a little bit more open with their application process. And that's why it uh, was something that I kind of talked to Carrie about. And she's like, yeah, like you should start selling on Walmart. So I actually did apply myself. And now I, uh, with my new product, I'm hoping to send some inventory to Walmart and some to Amazon, which I think will be really, really good because Walmart is an expanding marketplace. It's the largest retailer in the world, but it's also the second largest e-commerce marketplace that you can be on. And with that comes a lot of foot traffic. So with Amazon, you have, I think, about 1.9 million sellers, but on Walmart, you only have 100,000 sellers, while their number of consumers are are still both in the triple-digit millions. So you have a lot more foot traffic per seller, and that, of course, affects your cost for PPC. It affects like how many people are really looking at your listing, how many people you might be able to persuade with a great listing. And yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why um, I considered selling on Walmart. But also, we are doing this series because it is so much. Uh, there's so much potential for people who are already Amazon sellers to be on Walmart because they already know what to do. They already know how to create a great listing. 
So now it's sort of just that transference of skills and expanding into a new marketplace to tap into a brand new consumer base. Now you mentioned listings. Uh, I would imagine that was, was that one of the main differences that uh, you noticed, like, you know, having experience making Amazon listings, making that first Walmart listing, like what, what are some of those uh, differences? Cause there are some people who mistakenly think, Oh, I'm just going to copy bullet point for bullet point, title for title, description for description. I'm good to go, but that's not the way they should do it on Walmart. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not. Of course, both of these platforms are very consumer focused. They're, they care about their customer experience. But as far as how you structure your listings, it is a little bit different. Walmart likes the concise relevancy, which means that inside of their title, for example, they do want your brand name, they want your uh, product name, but then also the attributes, but they do want it a little bit more shorter. Their bullet points are a lot more concise. They don't want keyword stuffing, which neither does Amazon. Sure. But with Walmart, you really have to pick and choose and then cater to the consumer's understanding of that product. You have to encourage them to purchase. Whereas with Amazon, you do have a little bit more room to, uh, I have seen quite a few listings that do keyword stuff. And of course you still want it to make sense, but Walmart is a lot more precise about it because they will kind of reduce your ranking for keyword stuffing. So you'll definitely want to be more conscientious. They are similar in the sense of Walmart has rich media content as opposed to A plus content on Amazon, but you have to pay for the rich media content, I believe. And um, as far as fees go, you do still have the referral fee, the fulfillment fee, and then whatever time you might end up spending to create that listing and then the um, inventory you will want to send out to Walmart. So those are really the the costs that are involved with Walmart. Um, there are not really any monthly fees with Walmart outside of those, whereas Amazon still does have the $39.99 seller fee. All right, guys. So if you guys are interested to learn, you know, like I, we highly recommend if you're selling on Amazon already, you've got product in the, in the United States. It's a no brainer to to give the Walmart platform a try. I, I remember Carrie, uh, I was talking numbers with Carrie the other day and and she's got one product. I, I believe that's like outselling her Amazon product or the same product on Amazon, like two to one. Now, don't expect that. But sometimes you never know. Not only will a product on Walmart sell well, but it might even outperform Amazon due to, you know, the, the level of competition, but at the very least in my experience, you know, I, I usually see like, you know, maybe eight to 10 to one Amazon, you know, but, but Hey, if you're, if you're selling a hundred thousand dollars a month on Amazon, it's like, who doesn't want to sell another $10,000 a month on Walmart or, or $20,000. So give it a try. Um, by the time you guys are watching this, perhaps you'll see the, the video series that, that Carrie and Shivali did, um, go to the helium 10 YouTube channel and you, you might see it. I think it is, it's going to be called like you just do a search for a project, uh, project, expansion. What? Project, project expansion. expansion. There we go. Yeah. Project expansion. Also on the last week of freedom ticket, we're going to have these videos in there. The, the last week of freedom ticket, you'll already notice is a whole bunch of videos from Carrie and, and different uh, experts like Michael Labar talking about Walmart. But the, now she's going to add these videos there. So you can see it in freedom ticket or YouTube, check out project expansion where uh, they took an Amazon product, made it live, sent it to WFS, which is the you know Amazon or Walmart version of the uh, FBA, and and it showed you know step by step process that you guys can follow. So that that's for you know newer sellers on Amazon, experienced sellers on Amazon. But let's talk. Let's switch gears. Um, and you know a few weeks ago we went to Prosper. I don't know about you because you know I wasn't in your conversations with people, but for me this was the most I have ever seen kind of like one P very large companies, you know, we're, we're talking tens of millions of dollars of revenue, just like come up to the booth, like, you know, like L'Oreal and, and, and like other huge brands, you know, usually the prosper show in the past, most of the people there are, at least in my experience was like, you know, smaller sellers or, you know, million dollar sellers maybe, but these are like, you know, you know, hundred million dollar brands. And they were interested in like, you know, kind of like advanced, you know, marketplace analytics that then like the regular helium 10 can, can, can offer. Did, did, did you talk to people like that as well? I absolutely did. I mean, especially when you are a hundred million dollar brand, you have really big numbers kind of pumping through your business. You want to understand competitor performance at scale, just so you can understand your market share. You can understand the individual ASIN level performances, understand those benchmarks, how they're changing 
every single day, right? You have new competitors flowing in and out of your market and you need to stay on top of those things to make sure that you stay winning at the forefront of your field. And so we talked a lot about Market Tracker 360, which is uh, our OG market tracker on steroids. That's always what we've what we've referenced it as, but just well, so you what's understand. What's the main differences with the OG market tracker then? Right. So the OG market tracker has more of a set it and forget it mentality. When you input, you can input, I believe it's five uh, keywords and then unlimited ASINs. But then after that, you can't really change those keywords. And then you have to go through individually to mass mark products that you do or you don't want inside of your market view. Now, of course, that's great. um, But there's also not really access to the historical data or trends. If you have maybe fewer SKUs, then yes, it's something that you absolutely can use. And it'll completely pay off because you can understand the competitor performance. You can maybe even use it to expand on your product line, find new products that would do well. There are a number of ways to use it. However, if you have a lot more uh, SKUs kind of going through, then maybe something you're interested in is dynamic tracking. And then also a more granular view where maybe you can segment that information out into 1P and 3P sellers. You can filter it down further into maybe the mid-tier price ranges that you're interested in or even just seeing the revenue by brand year over year, the historical comparisons. You want access to two years worth of historical data. And all of those things are possible with Market Tracker 360. So Market Tracker 360 really offers you the capability of mass marking those products as they enter in automatically. Um, And you can create your market view now with 15 keywords and unlimited ASIN. So it's a little bit more broader and then you could go narrower as you are really trying to figure out what you want to look at um, inside of your niche, whether that's subcategories, categories, if it's filtered out by product title contains or does not contain. Um, it's really up to you, but you now have the ability to apply really complex filters to hone in on what you are interested in, which is really, really cool and invaluable. All right. Now, you know, most of the people who who are listening to this show are doing it without, uh, you know, without video. Um, but, you know, there, there's people who watch us on YouTube. So maybe if you can, like, share your screen and, and give us a walkthrough mm-hmm. of some of the differences and some of the insights you can get that are very unique with Market Tracker. 360 again. And guys, if you're, if you're newer sellers, don't completely tune out. You know, this is something that you can set yourself as a goal. You know, there's sellers I know who are doing as small as two, $3 million a year on Amazon who, who are using it. So this is a great goal to under, so that you can understand the level of, of data that you're going to be able to see once you get a tool like this. But uh, just Shivali, keep in mind that you got to be a little bit more descriptive when you're showing it, even though you can see it on the video, because there's a lot of people who might just be listening to this. Absolutely. So when you're inside of your Helium 10 account, you're going to go into tools and then click Market Tracker 360, which is the new and improved competitor intelligence tool. You can create a market in the top right hand corner. And when you do that, you'll be directed to a page where you can, like I said before, enter up to 15 keywords and as many ASINs as you want to define your market. Now, we do have a threshold of a certain amount of search volume. So there might be a chance that you might click this and then some keywords will show up as red. And that's okay. You can just remove them and then uh, simply kind of just modify that search. You can also select your products to add. So if you directly want to add some products that are already connected to your Helium 10 account, just click select my products to add and it will let you do that. On the right hand side, you'll see your market composition preview. And it's really just going to help you kind of define your market at what you're looking at based off what you've inputted. Now, anytime that you've already created the market and you go into Market Tracker 360, you'll see a list of all the markets that you have. And when you tap into one of these markets, and our creation times are fairly fast, they'll be created within 20 to 30 minutes of you actually inputting that data. I'm going to click into a market I've already created, which is the puppy backpack carrier for small dogs. On Right next to that initial market title, you'll be able to select date ranges. So I'm taking a look at the last six months. That's my preset, but this will apply to the entire page that you're looking at. So up top, you see market performance. This is based off those last six months because that's what I have selected. I also have our insights board right underneath the area that shows you the top market share. So you see that these are the brands that really are dominating inside of the information that I inputted, those keywords and the ASINs. I also have market unit sales and market revenue revenue and how that's changed from this set of six months to the last set of six months. 
Underneath that insights board I was talking about will show you brands, products, and categories. When you select any one of those tabs, it will divide that information into top performing, fastest growing, and top declining. So maybe this is good for you just to make some broad overview uh, conclusions. Maybe you see that, for example, um, you have My Baby, the brand, is ranked number five for revenue but it's also ranked number two for unit sales. So that tells me a little bit of information about that price point compared to um, Amazon Basics, which, which is really dominating at the top of unit sales and revenue. If you go down a little bit further, you have your overall market. Now I will uh, briefly kind of dive into this after I apply some complex filters, but just for now, uh, for those of you that are watching the video segment, you can take a look and see that this overall market chart really lets you break down all of this information that maybe you saw on the insights board or uh, even that you have provided based off of the market you created. You can now go into revenue and then group it by, let's say, your brand, your product, your me versus competitors, or even your 1P versus 3P sellers. So you this revenue grouped by none is really going to give you that overall health trend line. Maybe you're an aggregator and you're taking a look at whether or not this is um, you know, a, a field that you are interested in exiting from or even just taking interest in. You can see that this is kind of going down a little bit, but overall it's still up. You can also go into units, group that information um, by product, brand, me versus competitors. Again, a lot of the same information, but what you're really seeing is your revenue is on your y-axis, your week, month, or year is on your x-axis, and then these values are um, are really your group by functions. So you'll see that reflected in the products table right underneath. If you want to consume this information in a different way, you can digest it however you'd like, um, but I'm just going to keep it here on a line graph. You also have the stacked and uh, bar chart, I believe. Um, you can also change that into percentage if you would like, but I just have it set units grouped by products and I'm scrolling down. Underneath that, you also have all your products. Now, you're taking a look at 17,080 products here, but this is the overall uh, market view really with everything that's dynamically tracking inside of it. So of course, dog poop bags are not entirely the most relevant for the puppy backpack career carrier for small dogs. So let's say I want to filter that out. All I would have to do is go into filter right underneath the date range that we were looking at before. And then you can input whatever you would like. If you want, click 3P. You can input a specific brand or exclude brands. You can divvy up into categories and subcategories. Now, I already have a filter preset, and that filter preset is the dog carrier backpack, $25 to $50. And so the dog carrier backpack was the product title contains segment of it. And then, of course, I inputted a price range for the to, to kind of hone in on the mid-tier market. And that changes my information. We went from Amazon Basics being our number one for revenue and for unit sales that's top performing into this brand I don't even know how to pronounce. There's always such interesting ones. Uh, Leke Bobor. I don't know what that is. However, that's your top performing. I can also take a look at maybe my top declining uh, and you can see a completely different set of brands. Scrolling down, what I will kind of just jump into here because I really love talking about this and I think it's so valuable for people that really want to get those really a granular competitor insights is going into the singular product analysis pages or even the multi-product analysis pages. So what I can do here is I can actually select um, this product and click add to compare. And what it'll do is it'll take me into the singular product analysis page. Now this will tell you a little bit about the listing quality score. This listing here is killing it. The one that I've clicked into, which is the Pabo Abu pet carrier backpack, and it has a 10 listing quality score. You have the sales insight chart right next to it, which you can pick and choose what information you want to see between revenue, pricing, BSR unit sales, and stack it up right next to a secondary metric. Um, here we're taking a look at revenue and you can see that there was a drop in revenue, but there was also a drop in pi pricing, which tells us maybe that it's not so much the market itself uh, and the demand, but it could just be the pricing itself. 
If you go down a little further, you have your market average comparisons and of how that individual product that we selected stacks up to the market averages. And then, of course, uh, I, I did when I was actually at the Prosper show a few weeks ago, I did have some conversations where people were asking, is there a way for me to really track my subcategory BSRs all on one page without having to necessarily individually try to find those niches and look at them? Well, yes, you can. You can now go into Market Tracker 360. And as long as you're on an individual product analysis page, you'll be able to track all of those subcategory BSRs in one graph, which is really, really cool. You also have keywords. Now, this is my highlight. Like, I absolutely love this part of Market Tracker 360. I love it even more when there's multi searches involved. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Again, if you're watching video. So, if you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, you will want to either go check this out for yourself um, on the YouTube page, or even maybe you want to get Market Tracker 360 and try it. But there's keywords here. And for this specific product, it's showing you the keywords that are organically and uh, organically ranked as well as sponsored rank. And that is sorted by the search volume that are, t that are doing really well for this ASIN specifically. You also have the top search volume trend. So these are the keywords that you will want to really pay attention to. These are increasing in search volume trends. So this is a great way for you to go in and get ahead. And you can take these keywords as long as they are relevant to your product. Um, maybe it's something you just want to include in your listing as you are changing and re-optimizing your listing posts. You also have your top keyword sales. And this is cool because you can go in, take a look at maybe there is a competitor that's really dominating your market. You want to figure out what that competitor is doing. And you can do that by figuring out what are their top keyword sales and utilize those keywords inside of your own listing. If you go down a little bit further from that keyword section, you also have the top keywords over time, which is really a heat map of how this ASIN is rising and falling for different keywords over time. And you can toggle between organic and sponsored for that, as well as date ranges for that to, um, and that will apply to the whole market. So that's just kind of a brief overview for Market Tracker 360, but there's really a lot here that you can do with the tool. And hopefully this gets you excited about what it can do for your business as well. All right. So guys, remember this is, you know, if, if you're just starting off on Amazon, probably making less than a million dollars a year, uh, I would say hold off on this. This is not, you might not be ready for it yet but it's definitely something you can have a goal to but if you work for a larger company or you're an agency aggregators um you know big name brand 1p this is something i think that you'll get a lot of benefit from a lot of companies already have so if you'd like to get a free demo to see if it's for you just go to h10.me h10.me forward slash mt360 mt is in market tracker 360 so h10.me forward slash mt 360. All right. Now, uh, last part of this show, what we've been asking a lot of our guests this year is like, Hey, you know, how do you, what kind of healthy habits do you guys have to, to, you know, stay mentally healthy, physically healthy? So what about you? Like what, what are the things that you do to, to, uh, keep your body healthy, but also your mind healthy? So I absolutely love the gym. <laughs> I think, I think you know that, but, um, I absolutely love just maintaining clean habits for eating and then going to the gym just to regularly de decompress. And then I've been trying actually, one of my goals this year was to listen to more podcasts. So naturally, for those of you listening, you'll want to listen to a lot more Serious Sellers podcast episodes, as well as anything that you feel like maybe there's a sector of your life you really want to do better in. Find a great podcast, really uh, form that association. You don't necessarily have to know your role models all the time, but you can definitely get in touch with them through the content that you consume. So I love being able to read or listen to podcasts when I have time. Maybe that's going to the gym. Sometimes what I do is I'll get on the treadmill and I'll just put in a podcast and listen while I walk. And it's a great way to um, just stay healthy, mind, body. I know, Bradley, you've been doing the standing treadmill. You're, you've kind of inspired me. I, I want to get one. Just hasn't happened yet. But but soon enough, we'll both be in the the standing treadmill. <laughs> awesome. <Yay. laughs> yeah. Oh, Carrie, right? Carrie was the first, I think, who did it. And then I was the second. And then now, yeah, you can complete the, the team. The now, you, you actually, on the side, you know, outside of Helium 10 Hours, you, you have your own podcast now, don't you? 
I do. I have my own podcast. It's called Inspire Here. And it's really just about the journey of evolution. So all things that are growth related. I love having people on kind of talking about different things that maybe are philosophical in nature. Maybe they're just growth oriented. Maybe they're personal, uh, what they've done in their own life that has really propelled them forward. And so it's really neat. We closed off 10 episodes. We're about to start a season two. And I'm very excited for, for all the stories that we'll share and hopefully all the impact we'll have. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again for coming on the show and telling us about, you know, the new Walmart projects you've been doing, your own projects, Market Tracker 360, tons of great stuff. Uh, we'll definitely be having you on. Uh, oh, now, you know, now you're kind of hosting the show like once every other month for Tacos Tuesday. So we'll have to bring yeah. you back uh, more often. So thanks a lot. And we'll see you soon.